This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 13th chapter of Romans beginning with verse 11. As Paul declares, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Paul said, knowing the time. It is interesting to me that God would assume that we would know the times in which we live. That we would be current with the situation in the world around us. And that we would be knowledgeable of the time of the Lord's return. The purpose of prophecy is that we would not be caught by surprise. Paul the Apostle, in writing to the Thessalonians, said, Now, concerning the coming of the Lord, you have no need that I write unto you, because you yourselves know perfectly well that he's coming as a thief in the night. But you are not the children of darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. For you are children of the light. God has given you light and understanding through prophecy of the times in which we live. So that knowing the time, we should know the time of the Lord's coming. Not the day or the hour, but of the times and the seasons we should be well alerted. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because he said, you have enough sense to be able to look at the sky and predict the kind of weather you're going to have today. But he said you don't have enough sense to know the signs of the times, the signs of my coming. Had they really been students of prophecy, they would have known the time of the coming of the Messiah because Daniel said it would be 483 years after the commandment went forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. So he rebuked them because, hey, you can go out in the morning and the sky is all red. Say, oh, it's going to be a hot, windy day today. You can tell the weather by looking at the sky, but you don't know the signs of my coming. In fact, later on when he was weeping over Jerusalem, he said, and now the city is to be destroyed. Your children are to be dashed in the streets because you didn't know the day of your visitation. You didn't really study the prophecy and you didn't really know the day that God had promised to visit to you. 173,880 days after the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem that day of God's visitation that he had promised to the people. And because they failed to understand, they went in to that horrible desolation and the city was destroyed. Daniel the prophet was a prophecy buff. And he had been reading the prophecies of Jeremiah. And in the ninth chapter, he said, And I understood by the prophecy of Jeremiah that the 70 years of our captivity was almost over. For he had read in the prophecies of Jeremiah that when the children of Israel went into captivity, that they would be there for 70 years. And thus, he was ahead of his times. He was sharp. He was alert. He realized, hey, the time is about come when God is going to deliver us from this captivity. And he began to wait upon the Lord in case the Lord had anything special for him to do in the repatriation of the people back to the land. But it was through prophecy that he was alerted and aware and sharp 
on what was going on and he knew what was going to be transpiring all around him because he had been reading the prophecies of Jeremiah and of Isaiah. What time is it? Some secular men of science tell us that it's one minute to twelve. Several years ago, when we first unlocked the secrets of the atom, and by bombarding the nucleus of an atom with slow-moving neutrons, we were able to cause a disturbance in the heart of the atom, and it split, it separated, releasing the energy. We began the atomic age, and the scientists, in their bulletin that they issued, on the face of the bulletin had a clock and they had the hands of the clock pointing to five minutes to twelve. Now that man has unleashed the power of the atom, they realize that man has the capacity in time to destroy himself. A few years later, when we tested the first hydrogen bomb, that same scientific journal on the cover of their issue had the clock again, this time the hands pointing to three minutes to 12. With the inability of our nation to come to some type of an agreement over nuclear weapons. Again, this scientific journal had the hands of the clock pointing to one minute to 12. And there are many concerned scientists who believe that man is on the verge of wiping himself off of the planet Earth. An interesting article in this morning's paper which declares five days before the terrorist bombing in Beirut that killed more than 200 American troops, President Reagan wondered aloud if the world wasn't approaching Armageddon, according to a lobbyist who, had called, who was called by the president. Thomas Dine, the chief of the American-Israel Public Relations Committee, said today that Reagan called him October the 18th to thank him for the help in striking a war powers compromise with Congress over the Marine peacekeeping mission. Dine said that Reagan noted that the night before he had talked to parents of a Marine killed in Beirut and then went on to say, you know, I turn back to your ancient prophets in the Old Testament and the signs foretelling Armageddon, and I find myself wondering if, if we're the generation that is going to see it come about. Knowing the time, knowing from the scripture that we are living in what the Bible referred to as the end times. Paul said, knowing the time, it is high time that we awake out of our sleep. It is interesting to me that Jesus, in talking about his return, likened it unto ten virgins, five wise, five foolish, who were waiting for the bridegroom to come. And they were all slumbering and sleeping until the cry came forth, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and they awoke, and the foolish virgins, as they were trimming their lamps, said to the wise, Oh, we're running out of oil. Give us some of your oil. And the wise said, We're sorry, we don't have enough to share, just enough for ourselves. You better go and see if you can get some in the marketplace. And while they were gone, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in. And when the foolish virgins returned and knocked on the door, Bidding an entrance, they were turned away. And thus Jesus said, Be ye ready, for ye know not the day or the hour that the Son of Man is coming. And his warning to us of being alert, being aware, 
and being ready. Again, in talking of his coming in Luke 21, Jesus said that Satan would lay a trap for people in the last days and be careful that you're not caught in his trap. And his trap was an over-interest in eating and in drinking and in the cares of this life. Or the trap that Satan has set for people is causing people to become so concerned with this life that they are living completely after the flesh and not living after the Spirit. I believe that the oil in the vessels of the five wise virgins represents that life living after the Spirit and the foolish virgins were living after the flesh. And I believe that we are warned in the Scripture that we are to be alert and to be wise lest we be caught up in the snare of Satan and are living after the flesh when the Lord comes. And then Jesus said in Luke 21, Pray ye always that you'll be accounted worthy to escape all of these things that shall come to pass upon the earth, talking about the great tribulation and that you might be standing before the Son of Man at that time. Paul warned us that in the last days perilous times would come where men would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, living after the flesh rather than living after the Spirit. And Jesus proclaimed that the final state of the apostate church would be that of nauseating lukewarmness, neither hot nor cold, slumbering, sleeping. But Paul said, it's high time that we awake out of our sleep, for the night is far spent. The dark rule of man, evil men, over our world is almost over. We have slept as they have ruled God out and evil in. They have legislated that no prayer or favorable mention of God be made in our public schools. And yet in the public schools, they have decided that they can teach our children sex education, the proper use of contraceptives, and have gone so far as a kindergarten teacher took the children on a field trip to the drugstore to show them the counter where they can buy the prophylactics and demonstrated the use. And then we say, in case you make a mistake, here's where you can go and get an abortion and you don't even have to tell your parents you don't need their permission for this. God help us. Nations are driven by greed and fear to develop super weapons. And they're about ready to unleash them on each other. God has more or less released the reins. And man has gone about as far as possible. He's given us the rope and we're about ready to hang ourselves. Now the wise men today, the philosophers, their suggestion to you is escape reality because reality is hopeless. And you don't want to live in hopelessness, so escape from reality. And they have given different suggestions for escape. You might try drugs. You might try alcohol. Or you might try non-reasoned religious experiences. But whatever you do, 
Try something. Take a leap of faith. Escape reality because it's hopeless. The world in which you're living is a hopeless world and you've got to escape the hopelessness. Huxley, who with Dewey and Watson were the framers of our modern educational system, the men who have had the greatest influence upon our modern educational system, these humanists, Huxley, when he was dying, requested that they lace him with LSD, that he might die freaked out on acid. And thus he died. Trying to escape reality. This brilliant man who determined how you and your children could best be educated. High time that we awake out of our sleep, for the night is far spent. I saw a picture this week in the paper of three of the Marines clad in pajamas who were returning to the United States. They had survived that atrocity in Beirut. But to me, the tragic thing was that they each had a large bottle of German wine in their hands. It seems that's the best thing our government could give them as a reward for escaping the Holocaust. Sort of that saying, fellas, go out and just bomb out. Forget what you've been through, you know. That's all we can do for you. Just, just escape reality. And so we give them a big bottle of wine and say, hey, go for it. You know, forget it. The night is far spent. The nations today are preparing for the final showdown. We're sharpening our swords, getting ready for battle. And we are being called upon to arise and defend our freedom because our government now has given to us the freedom of viewing any kind of pornography you may desire child pornography, bestiality, whatever you want. You can have any kind of pornography. You can go down and buy it at the local store because our courts have opened wide this cesspool to let it pour out upon the United States and we have the freedom of indulging ourselves in any kind of kinky pornography. Oh yes, we also have the freedom of indulging in any kind of sexual relationships we may desire. And the pedophiles are even now lobbying for a new law that will allow sexual relationships between adults and children, consenting children, making that legal. Freedom to enjoy any kind of perverted sex experiences. Oh yes, we have the freedom from prayer or any mention of God. You don't have to be exposed to that. It might offend you. And so we are granted those marvelous freedoms. The freedom to abort any unwanted fetus and you don't even have to get your parents' consent. God help us. Through the misuse of freedom, we've about destroyed ourselves. It would seem that we would learn from Adam that freedom is a precious heritage that needs to be guarded and used wisely because if you don't exercise freedom wisely, your freedom can bring you into the bondage of corruption. And an unwise use of freedom has brought us into the bondage of corruption. The night is far spent. 
You say, oh, Chuck, I came to church this morning to be encouraged. I came to be lifted up and you lay this heavy trip on us. Don't you know the world has got its problems and I come to escape the world's problems? I wanted to sleep this morning. The Bible says it's time we wake up. Because you see, we were sleeping while all of these things were being done to us and suddenly we wake up and we say, my God, what kind of a world are we living in? A world about ready to destroy itself. How did this happen? When did this happen? Now, if we did not have a hope in Christ, I would suggest we follow Jimmy Jones and all take our snake, escape. But thank God we have a hope in Jesus. Paul doesn't end it with the night is far spent. He goes on and he says, the day is at hand. And the darker the night, the more glorious the hope for the new day. And because the night is getting dark, so dark, I know that it can't get much darker. I know that soon the new day is going to dawn God's glorious day of deliverance for man. Knowing the time. The time has come for the new day to arise. Oh, I know that people are going to say, Oh, I've heard of the second coming of Jesus for so long. And I've heard this stuff before, but we'll find a way out and things are going to be all right and life will go on, you know. And Peter said in the last days there would be scoffers who walked after their own lust who would say, where is the promise of his coming? Since our fathers have fallen asleep, things have kept going on. But Peter said, God is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. The day of the Lord will come, but a day is as a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is a day. But... The Lord will come. And to talk about the coming of Jesus Christ has opened a person up to a lot of jest, a lot of joking, a lot of being made fun of. And the minute I say I believe that the night is about over, the day is about to dawn, people immediately wonder when I'm going to put on my white robe and go barefooted down the street with a sandwich board that says, repent, the end of the world is near. I saw the other day in one of these little cartoons, this fellow was walking along, barefooted with his sandwich board, repent, the end of the world is near, and in brackets he had, this time I really mean it. <laughs> and so they make fun of the idea of the coming Lord. I saw another one, that same little guy, this time he was walking in front of the Pentagon as two five-star generals were walking out. And one of the generals, when he saw the sign, the end of the world is near, turned to the other and said, I thought that was classified information. And it is interesting to me that some of the generals are warning you the end of the world is near. Lewis Walt four-star marine general wrote the book the 11th hour and in this book oh it is a frightening book he tells you the end of the world is near as he spells out the tremendous military might of Russia and our inability to defend ourselves against it effectively the 11th hour Lewis Wall the end of the world is near he is saying President Reagan musing, I wonder if this is the generation that is going to see Armageddon. Knowing the time, it's high time we wake up. Hey, it's about over. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. 
To talk about the coming again of Jesus Christ was premature. I know people have been doing it for years, but they did it prematurely. It was really premature to talk about the coming of Jesus Christ prior to the development of a ten-nation European community because the Bible tells us that the last world-governing empire will be a federation of ten nations from the European area who will be joined together with treaties and it is during the time of the reign of these kings that the Lord of heaven is going to come and establish his eternal kingdom. And so we had to wait for a ten-nation European community to be formed before we could really talk with validity of the Lord's coming because he's going to come during the time of the reign of these ten kings. To talk of the coming of the Lord prior to the rebirth of the nation of Israel was premature. Because even as we read in the psalm today, that prophecy, when the Lord shall build up Zion, then shall he appear in his glory. And so we had to wait for Israel to be built up. That is a prophecy that is woven throughout the entire scriptures. Israel will be existing as a nation at the time that the Lord comes to establish his kingdom. Israel is existing as a nation and are being built up by the Lord and the help of the Lord. Knowing the time, the day is at hand. To talk of the coming of Christ prior to the development of computers would have been premature because the Bible tells us that the last form of commercial exchange would not be with money but would be with an assigned mark placed upon the right hand or the forehead of everybody and that would be impossible to have that kind of a medium of exchange apart from computers but in this week's or this latest issue of fortune magazine the fellow in charge of visa tells how that they are already establishing terminals around the nation and they have cities that they are now experimenting in, going to the new card where you do all your buying and selling with this new master card, which is an automatic check writing card. We already have experiments in service stations here in California with this new type of merchandising where you're getting rid of money and doing all your merchandising with a uh, pre-assigned number or card. And that's just one step away from the assigning of the number or the mark upon your body and everyone being required to have that mark to do all their buying or selling. But with the computers, it is already possible. The terminals are being established and set up in the stores around the world. And to talk about the coming of the Lord isn't premature anymore because tomorrow you could wake up in the morning and the paper would say you'll have until December the 26th to get your money into a bank account and from then on your money itself will have no value. I mean, it, it's that close to going. They could inaugurate it any time. To talk of the coming of the Lord prior to the development of satellite telecommunications would have been premature because the Bible tells us that in the last days, the last few years, there will be a couple of men, witnesses of God, who will be witnessing in Jerusalem and will be put to death and their bodies will lie in the streets of Jerusalem for three days and the whole world will see their bodies lying there and after three days God will give them life and they'll send up into heaven in the sight of the whole world. How can something happen in Jerusalem and the whole world be watching it except for satellite television? The other day I saw a program coming live from Jerusalem by way of satellite. Five years ago, that was an impossibility. Today, it is a practicality. And thus, to talk about the Lord's coming soon isn't premature. It's time that we wake up and realize the night is far spent. The day is at hand. To talk of the coming of the Lord prior to the development of super weapons that could wipe out mankind was premature. But now, both Russia and the United States have enough nuclear weapons that they could either one destroy 
every person living on the face of the earth. And Jesus said, except those days be shortened, no flesh would remain, but for my elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The day has come when man does have the capacity to destroy himself and thus to talk about the Lord's coming, the day of the Lord is not premature. In fact, that's the only hope for mankind today. The philosophers are correct. The world is in a hopeless state. And the only hope is the return of Jesus Christ in glory to establish his kingdom upon the earth. Now, a lot of even churches get upset with me and they say, oh, you're just giving the people an escape. They ought to face reality, you know. And they would have me come and sit with them and wring my hands and say, oh, whoa, what are we going to do? And live in a state of despair and hopelessness. But I won't wring my hands with them. I will declare to you that a glorious new day is about to break. The day of God's glorious intervention when Jesus shall come and establish God's kingdom. And we will live in a world that is filled with righteousness and joy and peace and blessing. I look at what we've done to the world. I look at the $192 billion added to our deficit this year, and I think, what's going to happen to my grandchildren? I look at the crime. I look at the judicial system breaking down. Some fellow the other day charged with over 50 counts, sexual assaults and all, and the judge turned him free gave him probation in spite of the pleas of the district attorney. That's here in Orange County. That man's roaming the streets today. Women, watch out. God help us. What about my grandkids? And if it weren't for my hope in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll tell you, I would be on my way to Rapaita. You say, where's that? I'm not going to tell you. But oh, thank God we have a hope in Jesus Christ. The day, is for, the day is at hand, the night is far spent, but the day is at hand. It's not just a dark night and then oblivion. It's a dark night, but then the dawning of a glorious new age, a new day when our Lord shall come. Now, how should I be living in light of these things? How should I live in the light of the darkness that has enveloped the world around me today? Paul said, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let's not get caught up in the darkness of the world around us and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. For if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we'll have fellowship with him and his blood will be continually cleansing us from all sins. Let us not walk in rioting. The word rioting in Greek is komos. It is a word that means reverie and it was used of the rowdy gangs going home after the game having just won the victory. Now, we hear it sometimes today with the high school. They've just won the championship, and the kids come through the streets screeching in their cars. Their horns are honking. They are screaming, and we're waking up in the night, you know, by the screams of the kids, and the horns honking, and they're having a great reverie. They've just won the championship, and they don't care who they disturb, who they wake up, who they're bothering. You know, we're celebrating, and we've got this time of reverie going. In those days, it was usually... A half drunken crowd going through the streets screaming yelling shouting waking people up disturbing people but not concerned with what they were doing to others in an unconcerned way for other people's feelings let us not walk in comos in rioting or in drunkenness not in chambering the word chambering 
means immorality. It's from the Greek word koiti, which word means the desire for the forbidden bed. We have some English words that have come to us directly from this Greek word koiti, which gives us the sense of the meaning of immorality. Let us not walk in wantonness. That is the Greek word azelgia, which is the ugliest word in the Greek language. And that is not just a man who is doing evil things, but the man who is proud of the evil things that he does, is not ashamed of them, and thus the, the translation often shamelessness, wantonness or shamelessness. He ought to be absolutely ashamed of what he is doing, and yet he's willing to parade his lifestyle before others. And of course we see the classic example in the pictures of the uh, gay community parading down the streets of Hollywood holding their banners and flaunting their lifestyle. That is the Greek word translated here, wantonness, ezelgia. Not in strife, not in envying. In other words, how should I live in light of the fact that it's almost over? The night is far spent, the day is at hand. How should I be living? I should not be living after the flesh, but I should be living after the Spirit. I should be walking not after my flesh, because that's the snare by which the enemy will trap people and the day will catch them by surprise. But I need to be walking and living after the Spirit so that when the Lord comes and the shout comes, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, I will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and ever be with the Lord and escape those things that are coming upon the earth. And escape gospel, you bet your life. And you better be thankful for it. For God has not appointed us unto wrath. And I look forward any time now to the beginning of the new day. God's new day for his people who walk after the Spirit. Peter said, seeing that all these things are going to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holiness and godliness? If you have put all of your value in the material things, you're about to be the biggest loser. James said concerning the last days, Go to ye rich, weep and howl for the miseries that you have, because you've stored up gold and silver for the last days, and now they've been declared worthless. Well, what can you do then to protect yourself in this crazy economy? I'll tell you what you can do. Place your value in spiritual things. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt and thieves cannot break through and steal. Live after the Spirit. Put your value in in the things of the Spirit. They are the things that are going to last forever. They are the things that will be valuable in the new day about to dawn. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Paul said, you should know that. And knowing it, you should live in keeping with what you know. God help us. In Jesus' name. Father, as we soberly look at the world around us and we see the darkness of the night, we realize, Lord, that we're about at the end of the rope. Can't go much further. 
we have sunk about as low as is possible without drowning in this cesspool. And so, Lord, we thank you that as Christians, we need not despair, but we can see the dawning of a new day through your word and through prophecy we have a hope a hope of that new day that is coming and thus as we see you building up Zion we rejoice because we know that soon you're going to appear in your glory help us Lord to walk in the light of the truth to walk after the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul the Apostle said, Therefore let a man examine himself, for if we will judge ourselves, then we will not be judged of God. And I want you to examine your life today. Are you living after the flesh or after the Spirit? That's the issue. The night is far spent. You're a fool if you're living after the flesh. The day is at hand. We need to be living after the Spirit. The flesh is a very powerful thing. Pornography is a very powerful thing. And I am amazed at how many people have been caught in the grip of pornography. It's able to grip a person and take hold on them and attach itself to them. And I've had so many people in the church who have come and have confessed that hold that pornography had on their lives and they're crying out to be freed and set free from that evil hold. Satan would like to trap you in the things of the flesh that he might destroy you in this dark world. But Jesus died to set you free. And Jesus is coming to establish the new day. And he wants you to be a part of that kingdom after the Spirit. But he wants you to enter that kingdom today by renouncing the hidden works of the flesh and beginning to live even now after the Spirit, a life pleasing to God. I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room for there you can find God's deliverance and God's power to work in your life to set you free from the flesh in order that you might live as you should be living in light of the age and the time in which we live because it's almost over and they that are ready will enter into that glorious kingdom of God that has been prepared from the foundation of the world for his children who love him. If I gain the whole world and loss my own soul I would be the total loser title the day is at hand think about Romans it. 13 and then 11 act to 14. on it and let us live after the spirit a life pleasing before God in Jesus name